Hello friends, it is time. House of the Dragon season two has premiered in the famous words of Michael Scott. I am ready to be heard again. Let's jump in to our breakdown of season two, episode one, Sun for a Sun. The beginning of the episode shows us a whole new intro, which I thought was interesting. It kind of actually for me was reminiscent of the intro to Wheel of Time, which I think is the only really good thing about the Wheel of Time show. So I thought that that was an interesting choice. I did like that we, we got this switch. I thought that a lot of people complained about the introduction for last season justifiably. It didn't really work I think and we have such high expectations for what the intros look like for Game of Thrones because the first series is so iconic so I was really happy that they did this. Our intro is Winterfell, we're at the wall which so good to be back in the north and the voice for our Stark is so reminiscent of Ned and John and just re-immersing us with the Starks, re-familiarizing ourselves with them, getting a little bit of that lore, that history, asserting the fact that the Starks helped build the wall. They always send one of their own to be one of the commanders for the Night's Watch. I like that we're getting that history and re-familiarizing ourselves with people other than Targaryens because the Starks are important even though they're not you know, super involved in King's Landing. We then kind of jump over to Dragonstone where we see Rhaenys and her dragon Melis appear and they have, they, she has a conversation with Damon. This conversation I think is really important because A, it kind of highlights my biggest problem of last season and why didn't Rhaenys just kill them at that time in the dragon pit? Damon kind of acknowledges that and I'm happy that this is said because I feel like this is something that needed to be vocalized and simultaneously Damon makes a point of saying, you know, the mother grieves as the queen shirks her duties and I thought that was really important because poor Rhaenyra is just struggling and Emma Darcy did a phenomenal job with just facial acting and showing us that she's grieving and what she's going through and the fact that she is absent from her role as queen despite the fact that they're battling and war on the precipice of war with each other. I love how they treat Rhaenyra as a mother. I feel like it is something that they do very well and even though I love that Damon is straight on the nail here with she's not present as queen right now and this is problematic and we need to get stuff done guys gotta get stuff done come on what's happening here and no one I feel like is really listening to Damon maybe as much as they should be but we'll get back to Damon in just a bit we then venture into King's Landing where we see a new perspective on King's Landing literally we're coming in from the angle of the dragon pit this is something that I wish I understand why they're showing the dragon pit and I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's going to be that's going to be a later conversation. But I feel like we have seen so many different angles of these cities now, including Winterfell at the beginning of the episode, and they're just continuing to change the topography of all these places. Leave it. Just leave it. Like, we know what King's Landing looks like. Just go to the Red Keep like they did a few scenes later, and that was fine. What then happens, which is a thing, is... Helena starts talking about how she's nervous about the rats. Now, if people are familiar with the source material from Fire and Blood, which The Dance of Dragons is about 50 pages in this book. It's not that long. We know who Blood and Cheese are because this is the plot of what's coming and the rat catcher is definitely involved in part of Blood and Cheese. And you saw... He was just lurking in the background in all of these different scenes in the episode and my anxiety level was growing. <laughs> I did not like it. But the thing that got my blood boiling was Kristen Cole and Allison becoming a thing because Kristen Cole for me is the character that I probably hate the most aside from Joffrey in all of Game of Thrones. He's the friggin' worst. I cannot stand him. And the fact that he is now getting it on with Allison, like, no, just 
No. We are getting interesting perspectives here on how they're trying to portray Aegon as a king, whether or not we think he could possibly be a good king, because it seems like he wants to make the right decision occasionally. Like, they definitely show this when he is hearing the petitions, but when he's in a small council meeting, we kind of see the Aegon that we're more familiar with. And I kind of want to know if they're trying to make him a more likable character or a more relatable character. I don't know if that's going to be the case because he is who he is, but I definitely felt slightly more endeared to him this episode than I have in previous ones. I think Aegon is a character of unfortunate circumstance, and I think that all comes down to parenting, which is something, again, that I thought was highlighted really well in this episode in that we see Alicent's conversation with her father and she that she's telling him, you can't undermine my voice because I'm already struggling to maintain this relationship with my sons. And I think that's been evident their entire lives. Allison didn't want to marry Viserys. She really didn't want to be a mother to these children. And I think it's evident. And when we juxtapose, when we juxtapose that with Rhaenyra's relationship with her children, especially when we see the return of her son and they both grieve together, that was such a moving scene. It was blurring the lines of duty and responsibility with familial love and bonds and endearment and I just I think that any scene that Emma Darcy is in with Rhaenyra's children is gonna be top-notch because the acting across the board is just so so good. I thought the name Aegon the Magnanimous was a bit much. It gave me an eye roll but then I also appreciated the fact that Aegon also gave it an eye roll because I thought that that was very unwarranted. One of the things that I did like in this episode as well was when we see Eric or Eric's conversation with Damon and he's talking about the O's of the King's Guard. For fans of the original series, we know that, of course, Jamie Lannister is known as Kingslayer because he is of the King's Guard, breaks his oath, and kills the king. I thought this was really interesting in his perspective of what happens when you per you swear to protect the entirety of the royal family and then the royal family turns on each other. What's my role in that? How can I go about doing my job without breaking my oath? I thought that that was a really interesting thing and I liked that we got that dynamic going on because it shows that other characters are kind of thinking about their place in this situation, how to react, and it's not just solely these two parts of this one family that are feuding. Okay, we've come to the apex of the episode, and we have to talk about blood and cheese. Blood and cheese is something that, if you've read it, you knew it was coming, you knew it was gonna be terrible, and they did it how I would expect based on the source material. And the source material, as I said, is not much. We knew that there were two people, their names have been lost to history. We didn't get the names in this episode, which I think is important. And Helena was put into a Sophie's Choice position where she had to choose one of her children. And I feel like this was, it was horrible to watch. <laughs> it was horrible to watch. It was slightly better than what I was anticipating. Just based on previous Game of Thrones gore and violence and how we kind of treat these things, I think this could have been a lot worse. I was also highly concerned for the dog. Happy that the dog ended up being, I hope, okay. This scene is, it's a way to set the standard for the season because things, this really is the breaking point between the blacks and the greens because as we saw, this was a very much a miscommunication trope even though I typically hate a miscommunication trope, I'm not gonna lie. I feel like it works here just because of the dynamic and how everything came about. I think that it is appropriate. So we've summarized the episode. Let's talk a little bit about what worked and what didn't work for me. What worked for me, changing Masaria's accent, this was probably the standout thing for me in this episode because I loathed her, her accent in season one. It was horrendous. I don't know why they thought to tell her that that was gonna be okay because it really, really wasn't. Did not love it season one, but I feel like now it flows, it's natural, it just seems like that's her actual voice. So I feel like that is a much better approach for the character. I, as I said, I loved seeing the dynamic between Rhaenyra and her children. I liked that we were getting some of the external history to the Targaryens and that it was coming from the Starks. Just 
getting to be back in the north was was really really nice i didn't like time being wasted on Corliss when I didn't feel like it was really necessary for this episode. I understand that they're trying to give everyone screen time because it's been a little while, but I just, one of the things I really loved about the first few seasons of Game of Thrones is that not every character featured in every episode. And I think that's okay because we need to just let certain storylines breathe and give them space to do so. And if your goal is to cram every character into every episode, you're not going to be able to do that effectively. So that for me was something that I didn't necessarily think was super important. I want to see what's going to happen with Corliss, but maybe at a more appropriate time in our story and in our journey. The one major thing that also stuck out to me in this episode was the CGI for when Rhaenyra dismounting Syrax. I thought that that felt very awkward. Um, <laughs> normally, I feel like the graphics are really well done for the show, so that to me just kind of stuck out visually. I didn't understand why that was a thing. But all in all, I still don't know exactly how I feel about this episode, and I think in part it's because I don't know how I feel about the show as a whole. I made a video a while ago that I don't think The Dance of Dragons was the best choice of what they could have chosen to make as the first offshoot of Game of Thrones television. I really still do think that they should have gone with Aegon's Conquest. That for me would have been my preference, but I get that CGI dragons sell and people want to see the dragons. I feel like I just don't love a lot of the characters in the show. I really like Rhaenyra and most of the time I like Rhaenys, but other than that, I find it's slim pickings for characters that I'm really rooting for and really like here. So I think that's probably why, because with the original series, there were many characters that I love to hate, but there were many that I just loved. So I'm hoping that maybe that will change, but it's an, it's an interesting start for a season. I am anticipating being riddled with anxiety pretty much every episode going forward because we are going to get fighting and it is going to be between dragons. And I know that they're CGI and that they're not real and I don't care. It bothers me whenever I see animals fighting and animals getting injured and it's going to be terrible and that's just going to be it. So here we are. Let's get ready for the rest of the season. If you like these types of recaps, let me know in the comments down below. You can always hit like and subscribe. Let me know what you thought of season two, episode one, Sun for a Sun of House of the Dragon. If you would like to help support the channel, you can hit like and subscribe. You could also consider joining our Patreon. It's brand new. It'll be really, really fun for you to come hang out in the private Discord. Also, we are gonna be doing a book club. So if that's something you're interested in, please feel free to come join and help support me. If you would like to follow me on Instagram, Goodreads, all of that fun stuff. The information is in the box down below. As always, thanks for spending your time with me and I'll see you next time.